All right, excellent. Well, thank you everyone for joining. We're excited to have you. Thank you for joining a very exciting discussion on women's health during Women's Health Month. And we're going to be focusing on the importance of diversity in clinical research, as well as product development. Just by way of introduction, um, my name is Avni here. I'm delighted to be here. And I am an Associate Director for Market Access Strategy at Haystack Oncology. Haystack Oncology is a molecular diagnostics lab focused on molecular residual disease. And prior to this, I worked with a variety of medtech stakeholders, really focusing on commercial strategy, product development, and market access. I'm typically based out of New York City, but I'm joining you from London in the United Kingdom today. And I am passionate about equitable access to healthcare and delivering that in ways that are tailored to specific patient communities. I'd also like to take a minute to introduce the organizers, organizers of this webinar. The webinar is brought to you by the Product Development Subcommittee of the MedTech Color Collaborative Community. MedTech Color is an organization focusing on advancement of people of color in MedTech. MedTech Color convened this collaborative community to create a forum where MedTech professionals and other stakeholders can address minority health issues in the medical devices product development and clinical research sphere. We develop strategies, resources, best practices, thought leadership, and tools to increase awareness and mitigate the impacts of unconscious bias, social determinants of health, and lack of inclusion on consideration of racial and ethnic minorities and critical aspects of the product development life cycle. Today's discussion will focus on spotlighting diverse female founders in the maternal health space. Since 2018 in the US, maternal mortality rates have steadily risen from around 658 deaths in 2018 to over 1,200 in 2021. Unfortunately, Black women suffer from a disproportionately higher maternal mortality rate than white and even Hispanic women. And this is why we have convened this discussion here today to talk about the importance of diverse female leaders in this space and why their perspective is invaluable and needed to solve this specific public health crisis. It's also my pleasure to introduce my co-moderator, Tracy Dooley, and our panelists on camera at this time. Tracy, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you so much, Avneet, and hello to the MedTech Color Collaborative community and everybody joining us today. I'm really excited to be here. Um, my name is Tracy Dooley. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm a partner at Avestria Ventures, where we invest in um, early stage healthcare and life science companies with a focus on female founders and health of women. Um, I am located in uh, Berkeley, California today, and um, just to describe my appearance, I um, am a mixed race Asian and white woman, but appear primarily Asian. I have black hair, I'm wearing glasses, and I have a dark blue shirt on. And in terms of what we're doing in equitable innovation, I think our entire venture fund is focused on women's health, right? But I would also add that obviously there's an enormous intersection between race and ethnicity and social determinants of health and as well as women's health, right? And I believe that these areas of overlooked opportunity are both the areas of greatest innovation in the healthcare life science space, oftentimes because it has been much of a white space, and the areas that um, are ripe for potential um, largest impact. So I think it's really important that we have a focus there and we support the great work going on there, but also that there's uh, potential for the greatest change and the greatest um, change in positive outcomes as well. So I would love to then go to our fantastic panelists joining us today and invite them to introduce themselves as well. Um, maybe we'll start with Ashley. 
right. Hello, everyone. It's really an honor to be here with you all and, and um, looking forward to the discussion. My name is Ashley Wisdom. I am the co-founder and CEO of Health Inner Hue, a digital women's health company that's focused on connecting Black women and other women of color to culturally responsive healthcare, um, health care, health care providers, health content and community support. I am based in today in the Bronx, New York. Um, I'm a Black woman. I'm wearing a white blouse um, with glasses and my hair is in braids. And I'm really just passionate about leveraging um, technology to provide access to equitable and affirming healthcare for women of color. How about Ariana? Thanks, Tracy. Hi, I am the CEO and founder of Navigate Maternity. My pronouns are she and hers. And I am actually located in Fort Wayne. I'm wearing a tan sweater. I'm a black woman and I have also black hair. Um, I, so Navigate is a remote patient monitoring system that enables care teams with the data necessary to proactively intervene with patients before a catastrophic event takes place. Uh, I'm very happy and excited to be here and hopefully we can do a lot of brainstorming today on, on, on how we're gonna solve this crisis. All right, I'm 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 happy to, to jump in. Um, hello everyone, it's such a pleasure to, to be here and in conversation with you today. I'm Maya Hardigan, I am the founder and CEO of May. Very similarly to, to my peers on the panel today, we are focused on reducing maternal health disparities for women of color and notably focusing on black maternal health inequities through a digital first services business that really aims to uh, bring black mothers all of the resources tools, supports they need to, to drive more equitable outcomes in matern maternal health. Uh, for us, what that means is that we're a, a digital platform that, um, similarly to Navigate Maternity, focuses in on earlier risk ID, um, digital education, opportunities to help to plug care gaps on behalf on behalf of the mothers we serve, but we've overlaid on top of that a community-based model of support that leverages culturally aligned wherever possible community-based doulas who've been well-established in reducing some of the disparities we seek to influence. Uh, in terms of a quick introduction to me, um, my appearance, I, I too am a Black woman, medium length, uh, dark brown hair, Black sweater, casually dressed as, as one is from work from our new work from home culture. Um, I go by she, hers pronouns. I'm located in Brooklyn, New York, and it's great to be here with you today. Fantastic. Great, thank you. Thank you to our speakers for being here today. Before we move on just to the audience, just a quick note that you are able to submit questions in the Q&A box as we move through the discussion. Um, so we're excited to get going here. Tracy, I'll, I'll pass it on to you to kick us off. Sure, great. And I'm super excited to be co-moderating this with you, Avneet. Um, so for our fantastic panelists, um, thank you so much for giving us a brief taste of what you're doing. And um, I'd love to just dive in here and get a little bit more background, right? So we can familiarize the audience. But I would love to understand you share with us why did you found your company and what was sort of the driving force be behind that founding of the company and how did you think about the unmet needs that you're trying to address i'm happy i'm happy to dive in um and and just share a little bit about the the, the birth story of may no no pun intended um i i started working on may conceptually about three years ago after a long career at that point 15 plus years focused on digital health and and i think with a lot of growing understanding of the role that digital health could play in helping to bridge access gaps helping to meet individuals where they were um, but also started this journey with quite a bit of maternal health nonprofit work and specifically having worked over the course of many years with an entity that focused on micro donations towards the funding of safe birth services for women who didn't otherwise have access, right? And these were disproportionately, unfortunately, black and brown mothers, uh, but also these were disproportionately interventions that made a lot of sense, right? They were intuitive, they were cost effective, they were clinically effective, right? And I had this nagging sort of voice in my ear over the course of many years, which was, why do these foundational supports that make such great sense and have the potential to make such a difference for mothers not 
reach black and brown mothers, right? It, it simply doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense when we think about um, what these mothers deserve, what they need. It doesn't make sense when we think about the downstream impact that's having on the individual health of black women, our babies, the security of our families, our broader communities, and and the like, right? This was the, these were these were foundational supports that every person in this life stage deserved to have, right? And so, I, I will say that you know a, a lot of the impetus behind my founding May really came from a lot of the um, racial unrest in the summer of 2020. I think for me personally, I was having a lot of very difficult conversations with my three young daughters, with my family, with my just community of loved ones around what was the respective role we should all play, right? How do we bring our resources, our knowledge, our, our different areas of expertise um, to the table right, and put them towards something that could be a little bit more meaningful and substantive for our own communities and also just something that would fill us up, right, in, in a more meaningful way at that particular moment, which was very difficult for all of us. And so I started working on May conceptually in the summer of 2020. It's been just about three years. Um, Tracy has been a part of that journey since since the start. Um, and what's been really interesting is, you know, I think that for me, I had a long and comfortable uh, set of many years in corporate America, right? I think at that point, I had actually been doing digital health work in drug development for many years. It was a job that I loved, I was comfortable doing, I've been doing for a very long time. Uh, but this, to me, really spoke to me as an opportunity to do something that I think would fill myself up a little bit more meaningfully, right? And so I made that big pivot, um, took a risk that I wasn't even sure I felt confident in at that point, right? I think so many of us as first time founders and as very early stage founders and teams of one, in some case, you know, we have a belief, but we don't necessarily have the confidence or conviction around that belief yet, right? But I, I, I will say that I'm very, very happy to have taken that dive um, towards doing something new. And, and I think exactly what I hoped would happen would happen, which is that we're moving towards making a difference, I think, for lots of women and families. And importantly, um, I feel very full. I, I think this will be the, the most meaningful thing that I've done in my career. And I, um, I just appreciate playing some small role in, in making things different for my daughters. Yeah, I love that. That's so powerful, right? And I think, you know, two big takeaways, right? I mean, it was kind of, you know, you had, you know, this idea, right? But there was sort of really this inflection point, right? That sort of really galvanized you to start it. And then also the power of a community, right? Such as this, which I, I personally find really fills my cup too. And so I love engaging with folks here. Um, Ariana, maybe we can ask you, were, were there were there sort of similar galvanizing events? Um, how did, how what was your founding story like? Oh, and I think you're still on mute. No, I was I was hopping in. Um, so actually, they're, they're they're four. So I have four children. So I definitely have had those experiences. And um, my my children are five, three, two, and one. And so Navigate was was founded really um, when I was pregnant with my third child. So much like Maya during COVID, um, I was actually considered to be a high risk mom. And I, you know, my doctors we had set out to have all these extra touches. And when COVID hit, all that stopped. And my husband, who was an orthopedic uh, resident at, at that time, you know, I looked at him and I was like, AJ, if something was wrong, they would never know. And we were doing, you know, telehealth calls, which were Zoom calls, and they had no actual data on me. So that was, that was my first clue. And that's really what prompted me to say, okay, I've, I've got to do something. And at that point, I was like, okay, I'm going to start Navigate. I don't know what it's going to be. Um, and through then uh, my, that next kind of experience when I was um, moving from Denver to Fort Wayne and I started to do research on the rates around prenatal and postpartum outcomes and realizing that Indiana was ranked number three in the nation for prenatal postpartum death. And then obviously black women like myself are dying three to four times our national average and our national average ranked 55th in the world. And all those stats started swirling. And that is that, that, that moment when it was like, wait, I've got to do something. I've got to really hone in on this. And that's really what prompted me to, to go full all in and, and start Navigate. But the day that Navigate became real for me. So now at this point, you know, um, you know, again, we're we're kind of working towards our goal of, of figuring out what it is that we're doing. But last year, I almost died having my fourth child. I encountered a very tired on-call doctor who tried to send me home, even though at this point now I am in an extremely high risk of uterine rupture. 
and definitely a high risk mom. And despite me pleading with her, despite me, you know, begging her to listen to me, she was just cold and dismissive. And my husband was away in fellowship. My mom was actually with me and my mom advocated for me on my behalf. And thank goodness she did, because when my doctor finally found out what, what was happening, she rushed in, took me back to the OR, opened me up, and they find that I have a huge uterine window, meaning that my uterus was so thin, you could see my daughter's hair. So had I gone home, had I not had my mom there, had all these things not lined up the way that they did, I would have gone home, my uterus would have ruptured, and my daughter would have died, and I would have died also. And it was in that moment where Navigate became real for me. You know, again, I'd already started the company, but it was, it's something different when it happens to you. And I saw just so easily how women, especially Black women, are disenfranchised in the process of giving birth or even postpartum, and then how we die because someone doesn't listen to us. And that was, that was game changing for me. So powerful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Ariana. Right. You know, and I think, you know, unfortunately, right. A lot of us have heard, you know, a number of these stories. One of my very close friends had a similar story, right. As a black woman, as a black woman, emergency medicine doctor who was also not listened to. And so, yeah, the power of advocacy and really standing up for yourself, you know, unfortunately these days, um, you know, that burden oftentimes falls more on the patient. And, but I'm really glad that all of you are working towards lifting that burden off patients and helping support them in these types of really fraught situations. Exactly. So exactly. Ashley, we'd love to hear more about you um, and share with us your founding your story and whether there are big sort of inflection points that sort of brought things home to you when you were founding as well. Yeah, thank you for this question, um, Tracy, because I think it's always important to, to anchor the work that we're doing and, and the why. Um, the, there's a Toni Morrison quote. Toni Morrison is one of my favorite writers, um, but there's a quote of hers that I often reference as a short answer to why I got started with Health and Earth Hue. And um, the quote says, I, got, I get angry about things, then go on and work. And that's what it was for me. So I was working for an academic medical center um, while also pursuing my, my master's of public health at NYU. And my time working within that AMC, I really got to see how some of our most premier and leading um, institutions are not designed to be safe or affirming for Black women. Um, Black women as patients and even Black women as faculty members or employees. And so that experience juxtaposed to me being in grad school and having access to all of these academic journals and reading um, about the disparities, seeing the data, I was really angry about the state of affairs for um, healthcare, for, specifically for Black women and women of color. And I got tired of seeing reading data, reading paper, or seeing data and reading papers, and then not looking in the market and not really seeing solutions that are tailored to the very specific needs that Black women in particular have as they're navigating the healthcare system. And that was the impetus for me building Health in Our Hue. I really wanted to create a platform that supported Black women with finding safe and affirming healthcare providers, and then also giving them access to resources that would support them with better managing their health, as well as um, navigating a system that quite frankly, just was not really designed with us in mind. And so that was um, my, you know, um, founding story. I started in 2018. I was bootstrapping while still working within the healthcare setting, setting and still were, um, doing my graduate studies. But 2020 is when I really incorporated the company um, we, our first product went viral and I was able to raise some capital to really put um, some more legs underneath this um, company that I had been nurturing and bootstrapping for two years. That's fantastic. And I love how, you know, the other thread, right, is that there, you know, all the preparation that went into it, right, you know, and the thought and everything and bringing all your experiences and resources and connections right to bear in this space I mean that really encourages me right to see just how powerful um you know how how powerful the thinking is behind it and how thoughtful you've all been so we've talked a little bit about sort of the lived experience but I would love to maybe sort of pair a couple questions together right how how did your lived experience lead to developing your technology or your innovation? And then also on the flip side of that, what has been your biggest challenge to innovation? So maybe you can talk about the two sides of those things. Um, Ashley, maybe we'll start with you this time. Yeah, so when I think about back to my lived experience as a black woman and also just as a black girl growing up, my I grew up in the Bronx, which is where I still live today. 
And I remember as a, a little girl, my mom would not want to go to any hospitals or any practices that were in the Bronx, which is a predominantly black and Latinx community. She would always want to go out of her way and like go to Westchester County where they're, you know, much, a much more affluent area where the hospitals are much um, more resourced. And I remember paying attention to how intentional she was about trying to find healthcare spaces that she felt could be trusted by her and be safe for her children. Um, and so reflecting on that, reflecting on my experience working within that academic medical center and what I experienced working in that setting, um, I just saw time and time again how our system was just not designed for women who look like me. And another experience I'll call out, um, I went to a historically black college um, for undergrad. I went to Howard University and I'm a part of a Howard alumni in New York email group. And I want to say about once a week, I would see emails from people asking for a recommendation for a black dermatologist, a black gynecologist, a black therapist. And I remember being at work one time and seeing an email thread going back and forth and thinking, why are we having to rely on our alumni networks, our social networks to try to find safe care and, and, and trusted healthcare providers? And I started thinking through how can I leverage technology to make access to providers more accessible um, to women of color and, and beyond that also supporting women with finding trusted evidence-based and culturally tailored health education. But I would say all of those experiences kind of um, shaped my perspective and worldview uh, or my perspective um, as a founder on what solutions and pain points I wanted to help um, address with the company that I'm building. Thanks. Ariana, how about you? So, you know, I, I shared that experience, you know, in terms of my own personal lived experience about almost dying. But when thinking about how that experience or the experiences of having four children um, informed how we built the technology, what what I started with started with was I actually built my team first. So in addition to being a mom of four and, and having babies, I also worked in the healthcare space for 11 years. So I worked on the med device side of the business, pharma, biotech, uh, global market access consulting, and actually headed a US market access a function at a large medical device company. So coupling that expertise with the personal lived experience led me to identify who are my stakeholders, right? And in this space, you know, I, I identified, okay, we've got, we've got payers, we've got physicians and care teams, mid-levels, doulas, people caring for patients, uh, nurses. And then we also have our patients. And how do we capture the voice of all of these stakeholders in the build of our solution? So how we did that was that we spent a lot of time doing our research. So, you know, we started to engage the very women who we weren't listening to, right? Or the healthcare system does, is not designed to print listen to. We're listening to black and brown mothers. We're listening to women um, from all different types of backgrounds to understand what are the pain points. Same thing with our, our, our stakeholders, same things with uh, folks who've worked at payers. We wanted to understand what are you all's pain points so that as we built the platform, we were solving those. Um, the other thing through my own lived experience that we identified and have incorporated into the build of the uh, solution was there you know, four key clinical gaps that my team I identified. Number one, a mother's touched about 14 times during the prenatal postpartum journey. Just what I was talking about, I wasn't being touched. So we need more data between appointment one and appointment two. And then because we don't have that data currently, it drives reactive care. So we do something once we know something. But the issue is if I don't know something till a month later or two weeks later, what does that really mean in terms of outcomes? And then third, capturing the social determinants of health. We've got to start capturing that, that data because a lot of times, I mean, there's a, a few different narratives. We understand that these other factors affect the outcomes, but we also need to have a baseline because many times we make assumptions about Black women. I actually saw Kimberly uh, Seals, Alice she, Acker, she posted something the other day talking about most times we assume that all Black women are on Medicaid. And that's not always the case. Actually, many of us that are dying None of uh, many of us are not on Medicaid, and if if people won't listen to you know it doesn't matter if you're Dr. Irving, if you're Dr. Wallace, again two other Black women that died while giving birth, um, or even post postpartum. If if these women can die and their PhDs and 
MDs. What does that mean for our, our Black women that are disenfranchised, right? So we have to capture that data so we can demonstrate that this is not an issue about just the S. DOH, but this is an issue about racial bias and how are, and how are we going to be, you know, just frank and calling that out and helping to actually solve for it. And then lastly, again, that brings me to our, our fourth point, implicit bias. We've got to solve for the subjectivity with objective data. And so with Navigate's remote patient monitoring system, with our hardware and our software, our, our goal is to just do that. We're capturing blood pressure. We're capturing weight. We're capturing social determinants of health scoring. We're capturing depression scoring. We know these are some of the key metrics necessary so that care teams can proactively intervene with their patients. Yeah, I think that's so powerful, right? And, you know, hearing from all of you, right, both translating not only your own lived experience, right, but the lived experiences of the communities that you're listening to, right, which is one of the biggest things that you brought to bear and being successful to get to where you are, right, and surmounting some of these challenges to innovation. I think that's incredibly um, incredibly powerful message. And I, I, I just will say for the folks here who are listening and who might be on the entrepreneurship side, right, this is, this is not really typical, right? Oftentimes I hear a lot of pitches in a day and I hear a lot of people who kind of have an idea but haven't really gone out and done the listening and done some of the foundational work that, that gets you ready to really bring a solution to the market. So um, you've got sort of the cream of the crop here. Um, and I would love to hear from Maya too, you know, talking about, you know, your challenges, how you navigated those. And I will just sort of wrap in. I'm seeing a question in the Q&A, like maybe folks could also, and Ariana, you touched on this, but what are the specific products and services, you know, and maybe elaborating a little bit on that and how that gets to your customer as you're talking about your solution. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll just take a step back and maybe start with your first question around lived experience. Tracy and I shared um, in my introduction, I have three young daughters. I am um, grateful to not have been in a situation like Ariana's, right, where I, I did not have a um, near-death experience when I was having my babies, thank goodness. Uh, too many of us have, right? I would say, however, that there was a lot of pervasive marginalization in my own care, right? A lot of um, voicing needs and not having those responded to. Um, I had an experience with my first daughter where, you know, the doctors rushed into a room and gave me a shot to stop my contractions without explaining why. And then I was advanced into a C-section. And I think it may have been the case that that was the best thing ultimately to do for me and for my baby, but it wasn't explained to me. I hadn't consented to it, right? And I think we hear a lot of these, um, these stories, right? And we hear these stories. Personally, I've heard these stories from nearly every Black woman in my life who has had a child, right? I, I don't think anyone has really been free from that sort of marginalization or disrespect or lack of listening in care, right? And so I think this is a problem that is just too pervasive for all of us. Um, you know, like, like my peers here, we started our work by doing a lot of deep and active listening, right? And so when I was first starting my work on May in the summer of 2020, I sent an email to essentially every Black woman I knew saying, I need to talk to mothers, right? Um, let, let me hear your stories. And the stories that came back to me were not unexpected, but they were incredibly heartbreaking, right? Moms returning home with excessive bleeding and literally calling the doctors and saying, I think I'm hemorrhaging at home. And the doctors saying, just wait, you'll be okay, right? These are things that will kill us, right? And so I, I think it, it to, to, to the point that was already made, it should not be the responsibility of patients and new mothers who are in a, a uniquely vulnerable state to have to save their own lives, right? That needs to be the active role and responsibility of our healthcare providers, right? Nor can we expect that every mother who's birthing and returning home again in a, in a very vulnerable moment would even have the um, wherewithal or be in the right mental state to be able to self-assess in that way, right? And so many mothers do not have obviously the health literacy that we on this line all have having worked in healthcare for so long, right? And so we need to be respectful and understanding and empathetic, and we need to approach all of our work with a listening ear, right? And, and just remembering that um, all of our lives are valuable and worthwhile, right? In equal measure. Um, I would say, you know, just to move on to the second question, and I'll talk a little bit about the specifics of our solution in the course of this, uh, biggest challenge to innovation and also perhaps one of the biggest opportunities if we wanna look at it from a glass half full perspective 
is thinking about how we can we can help to advance a paradigm shift around reimbursement. I think, right? So thinking about um, value-based care, thinking about making a strong case for more equitable investment in the healthcare needs and services of our traditionally most underserved mothers, right? We need to understand the impact, again, that that has on individuals, communities, and if it takes us so far as needing to justify it further, we should also be clear on the impact that that ultimately has on healthcare spend and on taxpayers, right? And so I think this is a really important opportunity to go to um, the folks who are leading, you know, our largest healthcare institutions and payers and make a an incredible and compelling case for what we need to do better and differently, right? Uh, it will be the responsibility of us. And again, I'm not saying that it should be, but I'm saying that it is the responsibility of us to really come um, with that strong and compelling case, right? Because not everyone thinks about it from the heart. Right. Many people think about it from the heart. Many people think about it from their pocketbook and from the bottom line. Right. And so I think we all we all have a challenge and an opportunity to make sure that we are um, messaging this opportunity in the right way. Right. Sharing those human stories, but also taking that a step further and making a compelling case for why we not only deserve, but we absolutely must have those dollars. Right. And a more meaningful investment in minority health and equity, generally speaking. I will share in my space specifically just because, Tracy, you asked me to tie in a little bit about the offering, right? What we're doing, again, it's digital. It's, it's a digital first services business, right? Um, I am someone who has worked in digital health for a long time. I deeply believe in digital health applications, and I'm a huge evangelist of digital health when we think about the role it can play in really bridging access, meeting individuals where they are. But it's not necessarily enough, right? Ariana spoke about bias and care and what that means for us, right? Not being listened to, not being treated in the same way, right? Even if we are in a position to effectively communicate our needs and our concerns about our health. Um, so for, for May, I think we're doing what we can do um, in terms of the, the best of digital, right? Um, using our platform to drive a sticky experience that's driving education, driving self-tracking, dri driving earlier risk ID. But ultimately, when it's all said and done, you know, we made a decision as a company to say, for many mothers, that may not be enough. And we need to help to make sure they have that advocate in the room, right? And so, again, we have the overlay of community-based services on top of our digital platform. That also introduces, I think, some interesting complexities when we think about how we um, contract and work with payers, right? Because we have this sort of, I'll call it a Frankenstein approach of, you know, we're part provider, we're part vendor, and what does that contract look like? And are the dollars coming from the medical benefit or the administrative benefit or a hybrid of the two? And it's not the easiest thing to do, right? But I do think that we um, we have found a number of partners who believe in the potential of the approach. And that makes sense, right? Because when it's all said and done, I think what we're, what we're doing collectively across our three companies is really bringing forward things that we already know work. Right. We know that having more data helps. We know that culturally aligned caregivers helps in driving more positive outcomes for black and brown patients. Right. We know that doula support, right, is clinically correlated with driving down some of those disparities we seek to influence. And so these are things that work. And I think what we have to do and what 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 is very difficult and, and we're all navigating is how do we actually step into a reimbursement environment? with solutions that we know work, but we're young companies. And so we may not have, you know, a, a, a dearth of our own data, right? And so what does that look like for us? How do we step in? How do we how do we continue to make that case and, and drive towards having the right advocates, the right champions to command that reimbursement and partnership at such a very early stage of our business, right? But the flip side of that is once we do that successfully, there's a role and an opportunity for each of us to play in reshaping that expectation for what, the standard of care should be for all of us, right? And making a compelling case for that across qualitative factors, across quantitative factors. I, I had an advisor who said to me once, you know, there's nothing that insurance companies hate more than being left behind. Get our competitors to do it and we'll do it too, right? And so, so I, I do think it's a real thing to say, right? Look at MCO X, Y, and Z investing in better health prosperity of their members, improved satisfaction and quality of care for their members. 
we create that and then the rest need to come. They need to follow. I want to just pull out on one thread, right, that you brought up here, right, when the Maternal Momnibus Act passed, right, and up to $9 billion in incentives were put on the table for Black paternal equity, right? I mean, yeah. we'd been talking to payers for a long time on various things, and we saw a significant change in just the tenor of, you know, internal conversations like being willing to move being willing to partner right when there is an enormous financial lever pulled there and so i you know i think it's all of these things as you point out it's very multifactorial right but being able to really make the case on the bottom line for some folks who don't necessarily um you know for 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 um for whom other aspects might not resonate as much right i think all of these levers are really helpful and uh, enabling folks to move forward. Um, it, it's, ab it's absolutely a tailwind. And I would also just say that one of the, um, there's absolutely nothing in the world that could have made George Floyd's murder worth it, right? Nothing in the world. But one of the, one of the things that has come of that heartbreaking incident is that so many corporations you know, government stakeholders, you name it, made very public commitments around equity, right? And really putting a stake in the ground, um, committing more, committing more attention, committing more people, committing more dollars, right? To a more equitable future for all of us. And, and that too is something that, you know, fast forward two, three years later, what have they done, right? They have to show that they meant what they said, right? And so I think we're seeing, you know, we're seeing some tailwinds around the dollars. We're also seeing a lot of people asking folks to stand by the commitments they made a few years ago. And I do think that we're seeing that evolution. Maybe it's not as fast as we'd hope, right? But I, I, I do think that um, we're, we're seeing more attention towards this issue and need one way or the other. Again, nothing would have made that worthwhile, but it's it's a, we're moving in a in a more positive direction in terms of folks needing to um, needing to stand by the commitments they've made. Thanks, Maya. I think you touched on two really interesting points related to the awareness and the market access pieces for um, highlighting ways in which stakeholders at large can increase access to maternal health care. And I think continuing to pull on that, I'd be interested to hear from the other panelists as well around strategies and initiatives that um, they you would like to be implemented to increase awareness um, across maternal healthcare services and perhaps how technology and we keep hearing a lot of buzz around AI and um, data, but how both of those components can be used in um, increasing access to your offering. So maybe um, Ashley, I'll pass it to you first. Sure, I, I can speak to the um, one piece that I want to want to touch on, which is education and outreach. And I'm sure Ariana will have a lot to say about the data piece. Um, but a core part of what we're building at Health Interview is um, creating culturally tailored and cult culturally responsive um, health content that's also obviously very much evident, based in evidence and evidence based. And I think that that is a core component to um, moving the needle equipping black women, black mothers, black birthing people with the education that they need to better self-manage their health as well as better advocate in the healthcare system. And it's unfortunate to have to say that, or to put the onus on the patients that they should have to self-advocate, but the reality is there is bias in the healthcare system um, and beyond bias, there is racism within the healthcare system. And so I, as I'm building health in our hue, I'm, I'm being really thoughtful and intentional about how do we equip women with the reality that they may likely face and encounter bias and racism um, when they engage with the healthcare system and how do we support them with navigating that. Um, and I think that that can largely be done through education and improving the health literacy of these women so that they are better able to advocate with any provider that they happen to, um, to encounter as they're navigating healthcare. So that's one piece um, and we're partnering with um, Black physicians and clinicians to deliver that educational content because the data research has also shown that black patients are more likely to adhere to the clinical guidance of physicians of color. And so for every black patient that wants to see a doctor of color, unfortunately that's not possible just given um, the lack of diversity in our physician workforce, but there are opportunities to leverage health content to bridge that gap and, and leverage trusted 
clinicians to deliver educational um, information. And so that's um, a significant role that we're playing with our product um, by creating that content in partnership with clinicians and phys physicians of color. And then the other piece I'll add is um, really helping to connect and improve the cultural responsive cultural responsiveness of physicians and clinicians within the healthcare workforce. So anyone who knows health in our hue kind of think pretty much knows this for trying to connect black patients to black doctors. But what I really say is we really are trying to connect black patients to culturally responsive providers and every provider has the capacity to provide culturally responsive care. And we want to play a role in supporting all physicians, irrespective of race and ethnicity with being more culturally responsive providers so that any doctor or a provider that a black woman encounters can provide her the affirming and quality and competent care that she deserves. Um, and so that's the work that we're doing. And I feel like that that's, you know, we need to put more emphasis on that education and, and supporting patients with knowing all of the treatment options, all of the screenings, all of the, um, the things that they should be encountering and, and getting to receive quality care, they should be equipped with that knowledge. Thanks for sharing, Ashley. I think something that you said that really resonated with me is that culturally responsive providers can actually be a great catalyst for ensuring that there is access to the individual, but also on a more macro level that there's um, market access um, strategies implemented as payers here. These providers championing particular types of care for Black maternal mothers. Um, Ariana, I'll pass it to you. I'm interested to hear about strategies and initiatives related to um, data and AI and technology that you're implementing or are championing to be implemented. Yeah, no, definitely. So uh, let's start first on the market access piece because I think that's in imperative. The bottom line is that no one can outsell bad reimbursement. It's just the reality of it. So when thinking about that, you have to start though with the data. The evidence is how you gain access to the market and evidence, meaning like the clinical evidence, published data. And one of the things that Ashley and I, we, we talk about, we talked about a few times is that clinical evidence right now does not reflect many times the patient populations that we're looking to serve. And frankly, payers have caught on. They're like, wait, that's why we've seen a lot of this, uh, this, this latest change. And we've even seen it with the F. FDA, we've seen it with CMS, we see it with now, you know, multiple different types of payers. And the, the bottom line is that in order for us to help move that needle, we have to generate the clinical evidence and generate the, that value story so that we can change that needle. But how do we do that? So let's take a step back. Black founders like ourselves need access to funding. We need access to SBIR. We need access, you know, you know, I know recently they had an um, NIH uh, conference. And my question was, I know there was a panel with black women talking about the problem, but how many companies that were, you know, were black led were actually funded by the NIH? What is that percentage of funding going or where is it going to? And it, it, you know, I'm not seeing it going to us. And so we've got to call that out because that's how we'll be able to generate the clinical evidence necessary to then come up with that that value story that payers need so that we can gain them as customers and help allow us to make this, our products accessible to the masses. And until we address that, that kind of, uh, you know, groundwater problem, we're going to continue to have this, this, this gap where black founders have to either bootstrap or go to VC to get the funding necessary to run a clinical trial when that should necessarily be the case. And then in terms of the AI, so I just want to answer all the questions. So got that, pers that, that, that first piece. In terms of the AI piece. So here at Navigate, one of the things that we actually found as a gap as we were thinking about adding in AI into our first version was that there's not a lot of training data on Black and Brown women. So that speaks once again to the evidence. We're studying you know, devices and, and products, once again, not in the patient populations that we're looking to serve. So when thinking about the AI, we wanna ensure that our AI isn't biased. In order to do that though, you've gotta have a good training data set. And if that training data hasn't been studied on this patient population, well then this, this, this AI is, is, is pointless for this patient population. So we're starting with just capturing data. 
And over time, you know, we I, I feel like we've got to make sure that we, we we do this right in terms of adding in the AI to make sure that it is actually helping the care teams, helping the patients, and that we don't end up building in more bias into the platform. So we're going to start with just collecting data, and then over time, we will start to build in that AI once we understand it and we know that it is reflecting the patient populations that we're looking to to serve. Did I answer your question? I just want to. Yeah, it does. Thanks for sharing, Ariana. And I think you took us on to um, something that MedTech Color has been talking about a lot in our internal meetings as well around those barriers to collecting capital. And um, we're so pleased to have Tracy on the panel because I'm sure that she can also add color to this next question. But um, Maya, maybe I'll turn to you. What specifically have been the barriers that you have faced when collecting capital and how have you um, attempted to overcome these? Um, in collecting capital? Yes. Yeah. So I would say that I am um, very lucky with May. I think that we um, have an extraordinary group of early investors who are heavily focused on women's health, heavily focused on minority health and equity. Right. And so very lucky to have gotten to that early group, which includes Avestria from from the very earliest days for us. Having said that, you know, I have probably up until this point pitched easily over 100 VCs. Right. Um, hugely distracting when I have a lot of work that I need to be doing. Number one. Um, number two disproportionately those conversations are not rooted in any understanding or familiarity in what we're trying to do and achieve, right? So I had, um, I hesitate to say this, but I'm going to go ahead and say it in the safe space. I had an OB, uh, white male OB on a fundraising call ask me if the doulas we work with nurse the babies of the mothers we're serving if moms are having trouble, right? So essentially our they wet nurses. And I said, these doulas are not necessarily mothers. Many of them are. They're not necessarily mothers. Even if they are, they're not lactating. And by the way, this is also 2023 in the United States. And when was the last time you saw someone take their breast out and nurse someone else's baby, right? And so there are so many, again, maybe subconscious, but biases one way or another that a disproportionately white male VC community has right, about who we are, what we're trying to achieve, and who our user is when it's all said and done, right? And, and I think having to be in a position where, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm simply not being asked substantive questions about my business because instead I'm being asked that, right? And, and it is difficult, I, I would say, you know, focusing on minority health and health equity uh, and not necessarily by and large having a VC audience who is invested there or focusing there or understanding of what we're dealing with even at the most foundational level, I think results in a uh, particular and unique challenge, right? Because the sorts of questions I'm asking, I can't imagine that any white male entrepreneur is is, is being asked, right? So that that is one thing. I think there's also obviously the issue about the um, very, very small amount of funding that goes to women and the much smaller amount of funding that goes to black women, right? And here too, right? We had talked about this notion of how we harbor the weight of responsibility to show, you know, what we can do and deliver, right? I would also say that in fundraising, I think we harbor a lot of the weight and responsibility to reshape this perception of what a successful entrepreneur and CEO is, right? Because right now, it, you know, and, and one could argue that venture focus on women's health or femtech or whatever it is is still a little bit nascent, right? And so perhaps we haven't had a robust number of exits under our belt, right? Given how young this, this focus is to, to really have shaped that perception, right? But what is very, very clear to me in my conversations is that I don't look like, right, the typical founder that they're used to backing and, and for whom they may have a successful outcome, right? And so there's an uphill battle from the start and a constant need to remind myself, and I'm sure my peers here feel the same way, that we are as experienced or more experienced in this area that we lead than many of our counterparts who do not look like us, right? And it is very frustrating to have to prove that to folks, 
right? I've got 20 okay. years under my belt. I've got 20 years under my belt. Um, the education, the experience, the knowledge of my business inside out, and that should be clear. And I will also say that I've had some of my own investors contact me, you know, and say, such and such investor that's looking at May called me um, asking if you're coachable. And my investors calling me and saying, you're the strongest founder we have, don't have another conversation with them. Right. And so the fact that that's happening, why is that happening? It's not happening because I'm inexperienced. It's not happening because I don't know my business. It's not happening because we are lacking traction in the market. We most certainly have that. It's happening because I don't fit the perception of what they believe a winning and a successful entrepreneur and founder is. Right. And so that burden falls on us, I think, to disprove that. But the sweetest form of revenge is success, my friends. So let's remember that and let's do what we have to do and we'll play some role in reshaping that, that narrative. Agreed. Agreed, Maya. I can't say it better because, yeah, I mean, I'm sure, Ashley, you've heard it too. Just the, the I mean, just almost mind-blowing comments. Um, this is a passion project. Um, what was you're articulate. Got that one recently. Oh yeah. I cannot, uh, I could not count the number of times I have been told that in VC meetings. And that too is something that would never be said to a white man. Of course we're articulate. We are highly educated women. Of course we're articulate. Exactly. Exactly. Um, you know, to your point question about, you know, I don't know if they have the expertise to bring this device to market. When my team collectively, we have over 40 years of experience and we are under the age of, of 41, well, most of us on our team. So that, that goes to show you, you know, we've been in this space, all of us 10 plus years, and we're still being told as a, a core team, we don't know when you see folks that have never worked on the business side of healthcare, um, and never worked in healthcare and never worked on the, any, any part of healthcare, but had a concept. And because they may be white and male, they're, um, you know, found they're, they're, they're funded very easily. Um, I think the latest stat that I saw on, I think on LinkedIn, it was like 0.34%. So less than a half a percent of all VC funding last year went to black women. So the reality of it is that the, the, the size of the pie that we actually get is, is so minute. It's not even a crumb. And that has to change because there is so much that we could do and can do if we're given the opportunity as our, as our peers. Um, yeah. So echo the same sentiments. And so, you know, it's, it's been a difficult ride. Like for instance, we just got our lead investor who happens to be a black woman owned VC because she believes in, and is bought into this is the team that is capable of taking this across the finish line. And, and now we've got the rest of the folks like, okay, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because now it took her, right? It took her to um, do that. And it, it, then, it then puts this pressure though too. And I'm sure we see this, um, you know, Maya and Ashley, I'm sure we've seen this like on Black VCs because they can't, you know, fund us all, right? So, it, so then it, it puts this undue pressure there for them to have to show up for us when really we need to, hold the VC community uh, accountable to say all of us need to start really doing our, our diligence and looking at these companies and not just shutting people out or, or, you know, making crazy statements like that because we don't look like in their mind what a founder is. So um, yeah, it's, it's been a major gap, but I think now we're starting to close that gap. And then the other piece, like, you know, you've got the, the one part of this in, in terms of just like, I mean, frankly, like the racism within VC, but then you have the other part of it is that you have black women within healthcare. And I think that adds, you know, a whole other layer. And like, for us, we consider ourselves a tech enabled medical device company, because we have hardware that is clear. And so when you think about then black women having an FDA clear device, and they're like, well, wait, like, this really doesn't align with what they envision they they would would fund. So um, it, I think it's taken us longer to have to close out our seed round, but it's finally happening. But it took a black woman to step up to actually make it happen. And I just uh, everything you all said resonates and is also triggering in some ways. But um, 
this other dynamic that I want to call out is that this idea that there can only be X number of Black women building these types of companies or the space is too crowded. Um, so it's like, oh, I, I already invested in May. So I don't know if there's so much overlap over health or hue or I've been, and that this problem of racism and bias in healthcare is too big of a problem for just one company to be the panacea. And so I think that that mindset within VC that, you know, people have been trained to just think this is the company I'm making a bet on. And I get the pragmatism of not having to like, you know, have too much overlap in, portfolio, in your portfolio, but this mindset that there can, I've already made my investment in one black woman that's doing something in healthcare. That has to shift. Um, and then something Maya said really like resonated with me about fundraising and how much time it takes. It's literally a full-time job in and of itself. And I was just lamenting to a founder friend just yesterday of like, I, you, we find ourselves spending so much time on fundraising when we really want to be doing the work um, and the work of our companies. And as, as CEOs, our, our primary job is like bringing in capital and, and closing deals, but also wanting to like take time to do to like build the products that we, um, you know, build out our vision. And we find ourselves having to navigate all these dynamics, bias and racism as we're raising capital that just makes it even more time consuming and more onerous on our psyche, on our emotions. Um, and so that also, you know, I just wanted to double click on that point. Um, but our companies are, are needed. And um, like Maya said, the best revenge is, is a success. And what I've reflected on this past year, even as I'm raising my seed round, it's taken a, you know, a longer time than I anticipated was we've still made so much progress with very little resources. And while I'm impressed by that, I'm also tired of that having to be the case because it then begs the question of what else would we be able to accomplish if we actually had the capital to move at the pace and speed to do this important and necessary work that we're doing. Agreed. Yeah, because success for us looks like making sure that women live, right? It looks it looks a little bit different than I think some other, you know, companies, right? That women lived and women had a great experience having a baby and that there was it wasn't trauma filled, right? I think that the work to your point is so important. And that success is is not just, and I think we all kind of take this personally, it's not just that the company is, you know, fiscally doing well. It is that we are actually improving the outcomes within the space. Um, so I'm just, you know, just, I, to piggyback on what I completely agree. I mean, maybe I'll chime in here too, from, from the VC perspective, right? Because, you know, it's, it's still, uh, you know, so I think five years ago, right? 98% of the VCs were men. Now it's, you know, like 87% but a lot of the women are not in decision-making positions where you're allocating capital as part of the investment committee, right? A lot of the women in VC are still at junior positions. And so I think we're, it's going to take some time for us to see this move through the community. Right. And, um, you know, I, I just hearing, hearing all of your stories, right. Having seen this as well, right. The things that, you know, People will say to me as sometimes like we get white men pitching us and then they'll say something to me as the VC that they're pitching. And it's there's a lot of tone deafness in the community for sure and a lot of bias and a lot of racism. And I will say just kind of me personally, how I look at this is, you know, when I see a black woman in healthcare come across our screen, right? I mean, I almost feel like, you know, from a signaling perspective, that means she's had to work at least three times as hard to get to where she is, to get that credibility, to be able to just navigate all this other stuff, right? Like you said, you're tired, right? To have to do all these things that, you know, a white man would just, he would be oblivious to that potentially, right? And so, and I think that that's something, that level of, when you hear the Silicon Valley VCs talk about grit, right? I mean, guess who has grit in spades, right? But also at the same time, that's not necessarily something that I think that people should be having to do so much, right? So how do we bring capital to the table, right? And, you know, at Avestria, right, trying to leverage our connections with other VCs to bring more capital into these spaces, right? Not that we're saying, 
we're going to only invest in black women and it's going to be sort of this check mark, right? It's like, no, we want to invest in great businesses and the strength of the founding team and the strength of the founder and all those experiences that you bring to the table absolutely factor into that. And that's why we believe, right? So I just want to say that this is one of the hardest fundraising environments in probably, you know, the last number of years, right? Especially compared to the the really somewhat um, ridiculous valuations that people have seen in the ease of capital in 2020 and 2021. But I will say that, you know, building a business on the fundamentals, which all of you are doing is so important. And that's going to be what helps you win in the long term, right? And I will also just say too, right, you know, one of our investments in fund too is in a black woman who's an MD PhD and she's doing an oncology therapeutics company. It has nothing to do with black health, right? It is just because she is excellent full stop. So I do want to, you know, I do want to make sure that as, you know, as we're talking about things, I want to be very careful not to overstep, right? Because I have a certain lived experience that I can't comment on others, right? But I do want to say that, you know, for me, seeing folks who have really excelled, right? That is a huge, um, that's a huge indicator of their ability to excel in what they're doing now and in, in founding their businesses. So um, that's very appreciated. And I will also say that from a from a matching standpoint, perhaps coming into this with a mindset of your ability to choose and having that abundance mindset of being able to say no to certain VCs who you would not want to work with, right? That I, I know it's hard because everybody needs capital and capital is not really it is sort of scarce right now, right? But being able to say no to things that are not mission and values aligned with you is also extremely important. And um, that will build you a stronger business and a stronger board going forward as well. So really sticking to your guns around that. I mean, again, I have so much respect for everything that you are doing in this really tough environment. So for you and all the entrepreneurs out there, um, you're you're not alone and there are people on the other side <laughs> pulling for you as well and trying to bring more capital and invest those dollars into these areas so i mean um just to you know validate some of everything that you're, you're seeing but also try and you know help you feel that there's some support there um so i mean i would love to maybe go and take the conversation into maybe sort of a little bit of a broader direction but how do you how would you advise you know um new founders who are thinking about starting a business in this space now like what would you advise woman black woman new founders how how would you think about what learnings would you want to share with them i'll pop in do it do it I mean, that's, that's really it. I mean, you know, on, on some level, you just gotta, you've got to take the bandaid off. You've got to take that, that leap. Um, we need more, right. To Ashley's point, this isn't, this is a massive problem and, and three companies are not going to solve it. It's going to be, they're going to be multiple. We, we need multiple players helping to solve this problem because it's also a multifaceted problem, right? There's a multitude of different things that we need to um, touch on and, and fix, frankly, before we really start seeing real improvement in our outcomes. So, you know, if there are other founders that are thinking about getting in this space, I say do it. And if, if they have a concept, build out a strong team and together build out a great product and then start. I, I agree with that, Ariana. I definitely do it. Um, I would say also find a problem that you're deeply burdened by um, because that typically is a problem that you are well positioned to address because it's something you just can't shape. And more importantly, to tie yourself and commit yourself to a mission more than just a business. Um, so one of my mentors told me like, your company is a company, you are, and it does not love you back. <laughs> um, and it is a manifestation of a bigger life mission that you have, it is not the end all be all, right? And so, I have a bigger mission in life to that is just really passionate about seeing black women and women of color more broadly thrive and health and our is a manifestation of that. And that is being tied to that mission um, is what keeps me doing this work in spite of how difficult it is. Um, but I'm tied more to the mission of the company than I am 
the company in and of itself. I don't know if that makes sense. It sounds like it's like counterproductive, but I would say commit yourself to a, a mission and have your company be a manifestation of that because that's what's going to keep you going and working even when you're trying to navigate what's the business model. Um, I'm, I'm struggling to get capital. Like being tied to that mission is what's really going to keep you going. Yeah, I, you know, I'll just add, I completely agree with, with both of you. Um, I will just add from a personal level that that imposter syndrome is real, right? I think we read all of what we read about Black women not getting capital. Um, we don't see enough um, Black CEO founders ahead of us. And, and I think that is very highly tied to many of the barriers we've discussed today, and it's changing. Um, but the imposter syndrome, this feeling of, you know, can I do it? Am I the right person? Am I capable enough? It's a real feeling, right? And, and like my colleagues said, move past it, right? Acknowledge it. Just say that as a feeling that may live with me as I'm doing this new and scary thing that I'm doing for the first time. Acknowledge the feeling and just push past it, right? Because to the conversation that we've been having, we have a very unique opportunity, I think, to bring a huge amount of experience, a huge amount of understanding and empathy to these solutions that we're building and putting into the world because they are so personally meaningful to us and because we understand these problems so deeply, right? So I'm in this moment right now where I'm like, don't suppress the feelings, feel all the feelings, but put those feelings aside and don't let them get in your way, put them aside, understand and appreciate why they're there and step past them and find your greatness, right? We, we all have a role to play in this. The need is massive. The need is bigger than any of us individually or any of our companies. And we need more of our sisters to be doing this work. Agreed. This is incredibly powerful. I mean, I, 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 I love this community for this very reason, right? Because there's so much transparency and there's like a wealth of advice. And um, I haven't been following the chat that closely, but I'm sort of seeing it in the corner of my eye and there's some amazing resources for founders there. So um, I'm that's also going to be, I'm assuming shared some of the, uh, the various links and things like that. But really, you know, the empathy and the passion and everything really sort of comes through. And that's, that's, that's also a lot of the qualitative stuff that, you know, VCs look for, right? And that kind of, that kind of passion, right? You can't manufacture it. And, you know, if you're, you know, you're going to come to a VC, you know, and say, I'm going to spend a hundred million dollars to learn this space, right? That's not really credible, right? As you've seen a lot of people in, in technology doing, but for people who have the kind of foundation that you have, right? There's, there's, there's a lot of opportunity and, so I, I fully believe that despite this challenging market, right, the best companies are going to be the ones that survive this, right, and not the ones that were spending much money on ping pong tables and beer, like unlimited beer, you know, but really building a true business. Um, so I would love to hear also, you know, your thoughts for the broader audience, how do you feel we can all play a role in driving some of this health equity? Like how can we contribute to, to building that network and that support system and collaborating in that community sense, right? Whether it's as founders or in different roles in corporate or as, um, you know, individuals. Um, Ariana, maybe I'll ask you, you, cause you've got oh, your mic on, but. <laughs> I was waiting. Um, so I, mean, I think there are a, a few different ways that all of us can play our part to help move this, this ball forward. I mean, obviously you have founders like ourselves, um, you have VC, you have strategic partnerships with corporate partners, you have uh, community partners, right? And so I think, um, I think actually Maya, what what Maya's doing and what Ashley are both doing and we're we're kind of doing but not 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 quite I think Ashley and Maya are both focused in that they're really bringing alongside connecting all of these these dots for us and I think keeping those lines of communication and 
community between or synergies between all of these different players, that is what helps to move the, the ball forward. To Maya's point, one of the things that I noticed, I, I relocated to Fort Wayne about two years ago, and I've been working with a few different groups here. And there were two maternal health groups in, in our city that really didn't talk to each other. We're having events like on comparable days. And I'm like, well, wait, like, what's going on? Like, why, why are we not talking and vice versa, you know, looping in like the hospital system. So I, I you know, I think that that's really what it comes down to. We need to start creating these, these synergies with all of the different stakeholders to move this forward because we can't move it alone. It, it's going to take all of us. Um, and I think it's talking to the other and really coming up with, you know, visions for okay, what do we want to do as a community, as a city to help change this and then bring in the appropriate stakeholders to help move and pilot this, this forward. I think that's why when the mound of us passed, that was a, a great, a, a great thing. And they're resourcing, but also to understanding like, what is the overall vision and how are we actually mobilizing all of these different pieces, right? And looping in the people who've been doing the work because there are a lot of people doing the work right now. And so it's looping those people in, connecting them and moving the ball forward. That's how I think we're gonna move health equity forward as a whole. Yeah, I think just building off of what Ariana was saying is um, just, reducing the silos that currently exist, like trying to remove the silos that currently exist within the ecosystem. And really as an ecosystem, trying to like try to figure out how we can solve this problem. Like what's pharma's role? What are the health, what are the healthcare providers roles? What are the payers roles? What are the employers roles? I think having that ecosystem um, approach to thinking through health equity will really help us um, and also policy. Um, my background's in policy and in another life, I'll be doing that type of work. Um, but really just like thinking about things from an ecosystem level, I think is, is it will be really beneficial to um, driving health equity forward. And I personally, this is more of a specific and tactical thing, um, two things. I think we really need to think through how are we improving the pipeline of, of diverse healthcare providers in the ecosystem? And then also how are we um, thinking about training for all providers to provide that more culturally responsive and equitable healthcare. I think that those are some tactical things that we should be really prioritizing in this moment if we really want to see um, equity really advance. Yeah, I I agree, and I will add um, not not a different point, but maybe I'll reiterate something. Or at a very very foundational level, I think a role that we can all play is just around helping to elevate the voices, right? And elevate ele elevate the awareness of the opportunities that are driving equity forward, right? And so if that means to the conversation we were having a little bit earlier, you know, elevating, right? Some of the leaders who are advancing the space to help our businesses access capital. If that means um, elevating our solution through brand awareness in the market so more folks know about it and we can reach more mothers all of those sorts of small things matter right and they're not um, necessarily requiring every VC on the line to invest in our business but it is a hope and perhaps an encouragement that um, if we're doing the right things to push us in the right direction that there would be a collective interest in driving broader awareness around those innovations that are actually making an impact I will say that we have a partnership with a um, an MCO in Michigan. It's been really beautiful, right? Because not only are we working with the MCO, but they have done exactly that, right? They've paused and said, who are the hospitals we can get you in front of? Who are the FQHCs we can get you in front of? So that every Black birthing woman in Detroit Metro is aware of the resources they have, right? And we can get this to more mothers, right? And so I think sometimes that's not more than an email saying, hey, let me introduce you to Maya. You should grab a call. We should talk about how, um, how to just make you aware of some of the work we're doing. That could take 30 seconds, but it makes a real substantive difference in terms of then the mothers that those FQHCs are working with, knowing that they have May and our services as a resource, right? And then that can have a huge impact for that mom and for that baby and for, for that community that they're in, right? And so I think let's just all think about the small things that we can do. We obviously should keep our eye on the big things, but let's also just think about the small things that we can do to, um, to drive forward 
awareness and again, to drive forward um, solutions in the market that really understand and speak to the, the needs we have and the experiences of our, our day-to-day -day lives. And I think that will, that will make a difference over time. Great, right. and we have one one question in the chat that's been um, elevated to the top for my attention and asked me it's specific to you regarding funding from the Bronx and New York City and whether or not you feel like funding sources in those geographical areas are listening to you and are working in partnership with you. Um, that's a chat, a question, sorry, that appeared in the chat. Yes, thank you for calling that out, I mean, um so the short answer to the question is no, I've not received local funding, um, even though Health Interview is headquartered here in New York and I'm based in the Bronx and there is a high need for support in this community, in the Bronx in particular, because the maternal mortality rates in the Bronx are just terrible. Um, there, I did apply for some state funding um, and once, and my seed round is, is gearing up to, to close, um, hopefully very soon. And um, I know New York City has some uh, VC allocated funding if, if for private companies that are venture backed, um, but they have to have their, their round closed. I'm hoping that I'll get some state funding because um, I, I applied for that, um, that program. So hopefully I'll have a different answer in a few months that New York State um, has directly invested in Health Interview, but to date I have not received local funding. Um, and that would be great because we're doing this work right here in the community. I hope that's the case that in a few months uh, the answer can be slightly different. For those of you who are in New Jersey, um, I have heard that the New Jersey has a lot of matching funding available for, um, you know, so again, right, that, you don't, it, it's hard to sort of shift where your headquarters are, but if you're thinking about this early on, or if you have the opportunity to do that, just, you know, I think this is a great thing to raise, right, looking at what's available, and then how easy is it for people to actually get it, and are they actually delivering on um, what they're, what, what they said they would do, um, that's really important, and a great source of potential funding as well. And I'll also just quickly add that I, the mayor of New York City has um, really prioritized women's health um, and hosted a women's health summit that brought together VCs, private companies, state agencies. And there's some, so health interview and I attended that, um, that convening and apparently there's going to be some great things coming out of that. So I'm hoping um, the state of New York, city of New York is going to be doing more to support private um, entities or private businesses that are focusing on women's health and maternal health in the coming, coming months. Well, maybe I'll ask a question too then. And it, um, so, you know, as an investor, right, we see a lot of, we see a lot of early stage companies, right? But from an early stage company perspective, when you're pitching VCs, and obviously you see far more VCs and fundraising for your deal, right, than I do, um, what are the things that really make you say, this is, this is the type of investor, these are the type of people I want around the table. What are the key things that you want either on your board, in your sphere, in your support network? What are some of those things that you really want? And what are the ones that you found either maybe harder to get? And do you have any tips on, I had to work really hard to get somebody with X kind of expertise, but this is sort of my, my strategy on how to find these people. Um, I would love to hear that from, from you and how you think about building out, you know, the company board, the, the support sphere around your company and how you think about that long-term too, and what you want to see more of. I'll just say most foundationally that I want people who care, right? Um, the way that I can always tell that when I'm in pitch meetings is if, if there is an absolute fixation on unit economics, that is probably not um, the investor who cares the most about what we're trying to do and achieve, right? Because I will say for, for all of us collectively, right? There's a social impact focus to our work, right? It, these are not purely SaaS businesses. There's a social impact. There's a public health mission to our work. 
um, which doesn't necessarily always permit us to charge top dollar, right? And so I think we we would collectively understand that we need to build businesses that can stand on their own two feet. But I think for me, it's a red flag if I'm talking to an investor and they're saying to me, you know, why don't your unit economics compare to Mavens? And they don't because we're we're different businesses and we're focused on different things. And, you know, when we think about the community that we're serving, when we think about, you know, Ariana's right, right? Medicaid does not fund all of Black births, but Medicaid does fund 65%, right? So they are a majority payer of Black births, which means that if we're approaching maternal health inequities and we want to do that in a fashion where we're reaching a majority of the mothers we've built this for, Medicaid needs to be a part of the conversation, right? And that is not, that is a very different um, financial construct and unit economics versus focusing solely on commercial opportunities, right? Which are not going to get us again to the majority of black mothers. And so for me, I, you can sort of sense in some of the questions that they ask if that fixation is more on the social impact meaningfulness of the offering, or if that primary fixation is on unit economics and no one who has a primary fixation on unit economics would choose to invest in May. Right. And so so I think some of that solves for itself. Um, but for me, it is really important that we find partners who deeply care and, and who, importantly, once you enter into that relationship together, will not push us in a, in a direction that's inconsistent with our mission and what we're trying to achieve. That's spot on, Maya. That's that's it. I mean, you have to have somebody passionate about what it is that you're you you built or are building and what and where where it is that you want to go, right? Because um, to that point, if someone is, I mean, granted, I want someone who understands and wants us to get to revenue, right? Like I think that's an important piece, and, and that's not lost on us. And trust me, we're, we're just as driven there too. But we want to make sure that we have someone that is absolutely 100% passionate about Black maternal health and wanting to improve the outcomes and that they're going to rock with you through the different changes because the reality of it as an early uh, as an early company, there will be changes. And so are you on board for what the goal is and what and what the vision is and 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 for who the the team is, right? That you're really bought into this team is going to reach this goal. And the methods may change getting there, but we're we're going to get there. Um, when I think about the folks that we want on our board, it's the same thing, always working back from our goal. So if our goal is to, you know, have a remote patient monitoring system that is that eventually becomes part of standard of, of care, who are the people that I need with the expertise that will align and get us there? So that's the same thing when thinking about who do you want on your board? And equally, I want them as passionate about this space, right? So not just they have an expertise and they, you know, they can give us what it is that we need in terms of getting there, but are they, they, they have this expertise and they're tailoring it and they're making the intros and they're committed to seeing us win. I think that's what you want on your, on your board and on your ad, advisory board. And I mean, I feel like we, we built a great board and ad board. So I feel confident we've got the people on our side who believe in us. Number one, my mom is on my board. So there it goes, right? <laughs> She's a guru when it comes to market access, but she wants to see us win. I echo everything Maya and Ariana just said, and I don't want to be redundant because I know we only have two, two minutes. Um, but yes, mission alignment, um, vision alignment, passionate um, believes in you as a founder, as a leader of the company and the vision that you have for the company and care about Black women and women of color. Like that is, if that's not on the table, then it's a non-starter. Um, and then also I would say um, investors who can help us get in front of the customers. Um, so we closed one of our first, our, we closed our first health plan partnership in large part because our lead investor was able to connect us to the C-suite of that um, health plan. So having strategic investors that can help um, really expedite your sales process is also from a business and, and, and tactical standpoint, um, I think incredibly valuable um, in terms of trying to get to the company at scale and as make the company as accessible to as many women of color as possible. That's um, something that I've been prioritizing as I have conversations with investors.
Thank you all for sharing. I know the audience has thoroughly enjoyed hearing everyone's perspectives and Tracy and I have really been um, honoured for you all to share your stories and lived experiences of why you found these companies with us. Um, I know we're exactly up on time, so I'll close it out and say a very warm and sincere thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you to our panellists for sharing with us. Thank you, Tracy, for joining us. And thank you to the MedTech Colour organisation for organising this webinar.